are like two branches of the same Bodhi tree. I wholeheartedly describe in them as our gurus, while we Tibetans are chelas are students. When we met him in the group, when I had a good fortune of meeting him last year, he had said the same thing. There also I didn't really place the context that time. But now that I was coming and I gave a thought to it, then I reflected that's what he was saying even then. Your holiness, we are truly humbled by your graciousness towards our entire culture. Uh, now let me briefly introduce the topic to you. Indian civilization, we all know, is over 5,000 years old. Some people say it is as much as 7,000 years old. And despite our different regional, social, and linguistic uh, diversities, we all have stood united in the Indian culture. And when I'm talking of united and unity, I'm not talking of the, the uniformity, because our strength is unity and not the uniformity. Now, this indestructible unity and unbroken continuity of the Indian culture is derived from its philosophy. And here I like to quote you uh, Swami Vivekananda, who, of whom not only we in Vivekananda International Foundation, but the entire country and maybe the entire world is proud of what he said. Every civilization or culture has a particular life center and a dominant characteristic or trend. As per him, that is Vivekananda, the life center of Indian culture is spirituality. Now, Indian spirituality is deeply rooted in our ancient philosophical and religious traditions of the land. And in India, philosophy and religion have complemented each other right through. It is in this context that it is imperative to recognize the importance of the ancient Indian wisdom, traditions, values and philosophy and make them more relevant for the future of the world peace. Now in view of the above, the topic at hand is very important and who better place than His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who is so well qualified, naturally gifted and of that stature to talk to us on this subject. May I request now uh, His Holiness to come and deliver his talk. Ladies and gentlemen, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Thank you.
Prasakti Islamic over parliament of religion. I participated, you see, uh, I think few few occasions. One I remember Cape Town, uh, one in Australia, one in I think Singapore or America. Anyway. So when the recent uh, meeting in uh, I think in Mel Melbourne, I think Melbourne. I express you see, this organization something very important, but looks your organization a little bit sleepy. <laughs> so then later you see they uh, came to see me uh, invitation. <laughs> So that last their meeting in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City, yeah. Salt Lake City. Uh, then they told me, since you expressed that way, so we are working more so uh, active or more Rota, more rigorously. So then I accept that, of course, I'm very much so willing to go there, but then because of illness. Uh, I could not participate. So in any way, I really uh, feel great honor some connection. Uh, now, of course, this, this meeting provide me a meeting for reunion with some of my long time friends. When I look, my long time friend. You see, then that reminds me, I also quite old. <laughs> like brother, you there, when he was working as a national officer, very young, very active, now looks quite old. <laughs> and Matali. My first visit to Europe, um, 1973. You interviewed me. What is the reason you have some interest to visit Europe? Then I told, I consider myself as a citizen of the world. You remember? <laughs> so this, uh, I say, uh, event provides me meeting my long time, my friend. I think all my friend, not only just a friend, or a superficial, but from deep inside. So I really appreciate our friendship. That kind of friendship, I really appreciate. So from the Buddhist viewpoint, uh, not only Buddhism, but also the uh, Indian tradition, we uh, we have the sort of concept of rebirth. Uh, so, one lifetime create genuine friendship. The impact that will carry life after life. So, in any way, thank you very much. You invited me here. Yeah. Now, the topic, as I I briefly mentioned the Sadhu. I think long sighted way, far sighted vision. So then I am one of the students of ancient Indian philosophy, Indian knowledge, including logic, and ancient Indian knowledge about human mind, human psychology. Uh, when I first came to India as a refugee in 1959, my only concern is how to preserve our own sort of this knowledge. Then with help of uh, Pandit Nehru, and of course come to India, and also various concerns, the state government. Eventually we uh, re-establish uh, 
major learning center over several centuries. You see, these uh, monastic institutions truly uh, a learning center. And sometimes we describe some of these uh, monastic institutions uh, we call Nalendra of Tibet. So we re-establish in India because of the uh, availability of land. And then these uh, re-establish in the Karnataka state, in Mysore state. So, so like that. And also we ask Pandit Nehru, do you want a separate Tibetan school? So Pandit Nehru fully supported. So immediately he asked the education minister, Mr. Mali or, Mali or something. Oh. 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 So he, as a chair and committee, set up to the society of education like that. So these work mainly preservation of our own tradition, including our language. Then, more wider contact with, you see, people from different continents, different country, particularly scientists. Then, it became clear how ancient knowledge, ancient Indian tradition, which we kept over a thousand years, say, a life read to rigorous study, not few moment meditation or something, or chanting, not that, at least 20, 30 years rigorous study, the root text memorize. Then, according to commentary, each word explain. Then, use extensively logic, debate. So that's not in the tradition. The Shantarakshita is the 8th century invited by the Tibetan emperor. Uh, he himself, at that time, 8th century, uh, I think the most sort of famous uh, say, scholar, a monk, Bhikshu, and great philosopher, and great logician. So we can judge about his knowledge, uh, a city. We, we, his, some of his writing available. When we read this, then we can, we can say, oh, that author is truly a great scholar and a logician. So therefore, uh, you see, when I sort of uh, meet, as I mentioned earlier, see, people, more serious people from different sort of field. Then it seems to me, oh, the knowledge which we get originally come from Nalanda, there's something relevant to today's world. Number of scientists now showing interest around uh, some of these philosophers, you know, such as quantum physics. I think detailed explanation uh, we call Madhyamika philosophy or Chitta Mantra philosophy uh, is actually, it seems to me, the background of quantum physics. So uh, we have sort of better position to explain about quantum physics. The modern, the scientist, quantum physicist, you see, there is up to a certain level, you see, they have. Uh, so the explanation they can explain with confidence. Then deeper, deeper, they themselves are not very clear. <laughs> Whereas the, our knowledge, all these ancient Indian masters, you see, they, I think, such a way, you see, to shift off, shift off, shift off, shift off sorry, precisely, very precisely, very detailed, so like that. And then also, you know, the psychology, human mind, the system of human mind, human emotion. 
sometimes I is a little bit bold, I think too bold, you see, mentioning or expressing the modern psychology. Compare ancient Indian psychology, they say, looks, modern psychology looks like a kindergarten level. <laughs> ancient Indian psychology highly developed, really. So now today, and firstly, you see, many scientists really showing eagerness to learn from this knowledge. Then I convinced now these ancient and dogs appreciate cats also. So sometimes I think animals are more honest. You human beings, because of this brain, because of our education, uh, uh, now, for example, I usually see uh, telling people uh, that we have this smile. Smile is, I think, the proper the way to express your own feeling. Uh, but this is so clever. This smile also sometimes becomes an artificial smile. Or Developed smile. <laughs> a scastic smile. Is it? A such smile is to sort of bring uh, sort of friendship or inner peace or sometimes more suspicion. <laughs> so so in any way, so today we really need education about our inner values. So existing education system very much oriented about material value. When the subject about truth, or honesty, these things come, usually rely on religion. So as I mentioned earlier, we will not cover seven human beings. And then also religion, there are different sort of views, different philosophy. So complications there. So India's tradition, secular way, teach about inner value. So, with uh, collaboration where, collaboration some, India some institution such as, as a Tata institution, and some other some universities, and also in, in America, the Emory University, uh, and some other organization. You see, now we're really working uh, making draft about a secular uh, education about sort of moral ethics, strictly secularly. So in this respect, India's thousand-year-old tradition of, firstly, Ahimsa. Ahimsa means Ahimsa with anger will not go together. Ahimsa, very much based on motivation level, Karuna. So, thousand year old in the tradition, Ahimsa automatically come with Karuna. And then secular. Uh, so, this ancient Indian sort of tradition seems now very relevant to today's world. So, so now only thing is, the modern Indian is not much pay attention about this value. <laughs> Sometimes I jokingly telling people, uh, you see, you Indian, uh, more westernized, uh, your culture, your way of life, also now create some kind of materialistic life, materialistic culture. That's why so, so many corruptions there, all levels. So, our, th our thousand year old sort of tradition, <coughs> corruption, corrupted action, also you see, some kind of day, or something interesting, not sort of violence, without the purpose of your right, but make money. Also, some kind of uh, violence against Ahimsa. Naturally, Ahimsa, as I mentioned earlier, 
Ahimsa and Karuna go together. So if you have Karuna, you must respect their right. You have no special right to Kasana, hmm, to use their money or something like that. Something like that. So therefore, I think ancient Indian uh, knowledge, uh, not just through prayer, but through sort of reasoning, uh, through logical approach. Uh, I think Indian ancient sort of knowledge. Now really, I feel, now it seems very relevant to today's world. So please, my Indian brothers, sisters, please now pay more attention about your thousand year old your tradition. Not just to carry some puchas or some as rituals, no. Uh, or study. See, about the human mind, about the human emotion. Uh, and then <coughs> the reason, the ahimsa. Uh, and then also the, with that religious harmony. I think India is the <coughs> only country where all religious faith live together. Yeah. Occasionally there's some problem here, but they are they're understandable. Uh, so basically, I think that India is the only nation where, besides the homegrown different religion, but all world major tradition now uh, settled in this country. Wonderful. So I often say that in some concerned officials uh, that come to India. You see, India should now make active rule regarding promotion of religious harmony. And particularly nowadays, you see, there, in some cases, in some area, religion itself you know, dividing, not only dividing, but killing. So the India's tradition or religious harmony is very, very relevant. So over a billion populated nation, in spite of a lot of problems, but religious harmony, basically, I think, really you get this, not only just political religion, over 3,000 years, you see, you have this sort of tradition, religious harmony. So these are something very so, now that's about the ancient Indian Kasoda. In the thought, or in the knowledge, or something relevant to this world. So these, uh, not, I'm, I'm talking this just the intellectual level, but through my own experience, now it becomes clear. So this ancient Indian sort of knowledge, now, uh, very much relevant to this world. So my, if may I say so, uh, my elder brothers, sisters, now, okay, <laughs> now this younger one, uh, pay more attention about your thousand year old tradition. And the old people also, you see, advise your children, grandchildren, grand grandchildren. Uh, that's all, thank you. Now I, I prefer passion of answer, some interaction. And since there's many people, experienced people, so I, I would like to have some suggestions or some criticisms. Thank you. We now have the question answer session. So kindly raise your hand and when you have a question to ask, kindly introduce your, uh, yourself. Yeah. Your Holiness, uh, your, your Holiness, thank you very much for the lecture. I think, uh, I believe you are 82 years old. I just wanted to ask you, how do you look so young? <laughs> yes, often you see, my friend asked me that question. So I usually tell them, that's my secret. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you see, 
think uh, nothing special. I, I think many of you, I think, may share. You see, each night, nine hours sleep. <laughs> About six o'clock sleep. Then next, three o'clock wake up. And some meditation. See, meditation, the analytical meditation, mainly. Analyze, analyze, analyze. We call it vipassana. Not only breathing on these things, but actually intellectual level. Analyze uh, everything. Uh, firstly, analyze whether there is atma or what is the atma or anatma. And the patitsamubhan. I found really immense effect. My beings. So I usually see uh, telling people, uh, according Nalanda tradition, we use maximum way about our intelligence. Through that way, transform about our emotion. That's the unique thing about the Nalanda tradition, not just prayer. So I do that. So uh, from three o'clock morning. Then next, about four, four hours, some meditation, and including some prayer. But then afternoon, another one hour. So altogether, five hours. So then my mind, I think I, my life, you see, all my life, you see, in the, because of the, in the circumstances of difficulties, for example, <laughs> Age 16, I lost my freedom. Age 24, I lost my own country. And a lot of sort of really, because of the sad news, often, just now. And meantime, it's a Tibetan. Uh, I think 99% Tibetan, trust me. So mentally, I cannot do much. So therefore, it's mentally not also a burden. But however, as the Nalanda Master say, the difficulties, the things when you face and analyze, if that difficulties can overcome, then no need to worry. If the difficulties no way to overcome, then no use. <laughs> much sorry, much worry. It's very realistic. Very interesting. So I do that. So therefore, uh, my dear tutor often, you see, took this quotation. When I express some sort of sad thing, he always, you see, telling me and use this quotation. So it's very practical. And then also, you know, as is the, uh, the Madhimika from also his view, everything interconnected interrelated. So one event not independently developed, but due to many other factors, uh, including your own mistakes. Then you see there is no independent absolute target of anger. Everything interrelated. So therefore you see that kind of attitude very, very helpful to keep peace of mind. Like that. So these are my secret. <laughs> okay. Then, yes. then those people, I, I think including you, uh, they've been overweight. <laughs> then, then, you know, uh, one hour practice as a monk, no dinner. So that also very good to check, to balance our office. <laughs> uh, Your Holiness, uh, I have been given the permission to ask the next question. Uh, the ma a major problem facing the world today is radical Islam, which is very intransigent because it does not accept um, tolerance of others. What is the best way to deal with this? 
I think you should not use the word because of radical Islam, sorry, Muslim. Looks, Indian Muslim uh, and Muslim in Malaysia, Muslim in Indonesia, because you see the circumstances, they live with other traditions. So now in this country, India, Shia, Sunni, no problem. But they have divided India. Hmm? Now, uh, now, I think the, uh, the environment, some of these Muslim countries, I think uh, Jordan, I have been uh, some occasion, Jordan. <coughs> I met some Jordan in uh, uh, sorry, school, school children. They may uh, ask some questions. Very sort of, it's very same the other, other students or other countries because of education. More sort of, say, uh, because of the close of touch with outside the world. Whereas some Muslim countries, they bit isolated, much less contact with outside world. Then I think the problem, the century old concept, one religion, one truth. No. Uh, when I was in Tibet, a little bit isolated, I also have this sort of concept of uh, concept of one truth, one religion. That's a good thing. When after I came to India, uh, more sort of wider contact with people from different faiths, then, oh, uh, there are wonderful people among the Muslims, among the Hindus, among the Christians, among the Jews, among the Sikhs. So therefore, that is very, very helpful, you see, to understand, to deeper understanding about the value of other tradition. Then the concept of several truth, several religion is very relevant. So I think uh, so recent recent years, you see, I publicly associating the very word wording the uh, uh, Muslim terrorist is wrong. You see as soon as you see a person whose background Muslim, you see, you see, because of the committed violence, then actually no longer genuine Muslim. <coughs> Some my Muslim friend told me, uh, genuine Muslim practitioner, you see, if you create some bloodshed, then you are no longer genuine Muslim. And uh, also, you see, they say the Muslim practitioner must extend love towards entire creation, creature, creation, or creature of Allah. Really wonderful. And then the very meaning of jihad, not sort of hitting some other person, but real jihad meaning combat your own negative emotion. The former chief minister of Jammu Kashmir, Kasapong Min Raza, Farooq Abdullah. Farooq Abdullah, you see, once told me that. Then one occasion in New York, I have some sort of meeting with some professors. Uh, I asked that, you see, I got confirmation from one Muslim scholar. <laughs> so, like that. So, you see, I think due to narrow-minded, short-sighted, and not properly practiced Muslim. And due to their sort of behavior, then we create some kind of impression. Islam is more militant or something. That's why they totally wrong. So we must respect Islam. One of the great religion, see, one billion uh, follower of Quran, so respect that and gradually reach out to our Muslim brothers and sisters.
it will eventually hard to hide. Then there are mind things. Due to some sort of uh, incidents, some sort of sad event, and military action, showing force, I think that hardened. Actually, uh, Asa, actually, uh, September 11th, Next day, threat, I wrote a letter to President Bush because I know him. I respect him. So I wrote uh, while I express my sort of, of condolence, uh, sadness, but I also express.